Hello and welcome to Crucible of Words for more dedicated legacy action. Today we are playing a deck that has been the most requested deck on my channel for a little while now and that is Death and Taxes. I was kind of waiting for the initiative to get a ban before playing it, so here we are. We have White Plume Adventure banned from the format, so I think DT is in a bit of a better spot. So let's get into it. What does this deck aim to do? This is sort of like a mid rangey disruptive deck where all of our creatures come with a little bit of extra value here and there. So we've got the sort of core of our disruption package it tends to be around Thalia, Guardian Thraben, and Mother of Runes. So this makes our opponent's spells cost more. Mother of Runes makes our opponent's removal kind of worthless. And we have Spirit of Labyrinth, which also disrupts our opponent's ability to draw extra cards, which is pretty big in a world of Ponder and Brainstorm. And we've got lots of um, things that we can find with our Recruiter of the Guard and our Flicker Wisp that can blink our Recruiter of the Guard or blink some of the things we find with Recruiter of the Guard. So Recruiter of the Guard can go and find Solitude or it can find a Singleton Loran to blow Problem Permanents up, a Lion Sash for Graveyard Hate, Containment Priest for things like Graveyard Hate as well as uh, sneak and show type hate. Some Sky of Apparitions, we can get, we've got three of these as removal, we can go find them and blink them. Sanctum Prelate to shut down specific non-creature spell values. And that's kind of it for the uh, Recruiter of the Guard package. But we also have another package in the form of Stoneforge Mystics. So we've got four Stoneforge Mystics. We've got the usual Umazawa's Jitte, Badaskull and Call to Complete. But we also have this little new card here, Trailblazer's Torch. So basically what this is, is just four mana, you take the initiative or two mana for putting in with a Stoneforge and sometimes that's going to be pretty good. The rest of the text on this card pretty much doesn't exist. It might come up in some niche scenarios but for the most part this is just a way that we can use Stoneforge Mystic to get us the initiative. And because we've got loads of guys it's going to be quite easy to sit behind and protect that. But our disruption package isn't just in our creatures, it's also in some spells. We've got some Source Supply Shares uh, we've got Ether Vial, so we can kind of ignore opponents' counter spells with them, which is really good. It can disrupt people's game plans if they're trying to counter spell things you're doing. But then we have this selection of our land. So we've got a whole bunch of planes, fair enough. But then we've got some Aganjos as removal that's also lands. We've got a load of ways of disrupting our opponent's mana. So we've got four Wastelands, four Richard and Ports, and a couple of Ghost Quarters. These are sometimes the Field of Ruin, but in the list I found... This, they were running Ghost Quarter, and I've always been a fan of Ghost Quarter over things like Field of Ruin, just because if you do need to blow up a specific land for specific reasons, Ghost Quarter is just the most efficient way of doing that. And with a few people trying out things like Infect, I felt that was alright, and was the sensible pick there. And we have Caracas, which is... We, uh, we've got four of them, but we're an 80-card deck. Because if you hadn't noticed, there's a lot of cards in this deck, and we've got a Yorion on the sideboard. So the idea is that we're less likely to draw our Silver Bullets, but we can always find them if we want them because of our Recruit of the Guard package. So the idea is that our Silver Bullets don't jam up our hand unless we want them to. And we have such long game value and inevitability with just your arm blinking our board, getting loads of stuff back. We should be able to grind out wins here. And the caracas Yorion combo is pretty strong because that just lets us reset of all of our common to play triggers every turn if we want to. And we can put the Yorion in off a of Vial and just bounce it every turn. And that's kind of a very difficult to be end game thing and we just hope we can get there by disrupting our opponent but sometimes we can just smash a cauldron to play on turn three and just race our opponent that way. So we've kind of got a lot of angles of attack and a lot of decisions to be made despite it being a mono white deck without you know card selection like brainstorm and ponders and things and it must be said that I am not a DNT player so I'm going to try my best here. I've played against it a whole bunch obviously but we're going to see how we go with it today. A little chat about the sideboard. Obviously lose one of our sideboard slots to Yorion. We've got a little bit more removal in the form of Path and Council's Judgment. Obviously Councils can hit things that we would otherwise struggle to hit. Things like Trio Nemesis, for example. We've got Graveyard Hate in the form of Rest in Peace, Leyline, and Surge Extraction. So Graveyard Hate is really important right now. So we've got lots of pieces and we're an 80 card deck. So we kind of need to guarantee we have it, which means we have to dedicate more sideboard slots to Graveyard Hate. We have one Mindbreak Trap for the purposes of Storm. Not really sure what one mind break trap in an 80 card deck is going to do, but we have it anyway. A Graft Digger's Cage, another piece of Graveyard Hate, but also doubles up for a similar effect as of Containment Priest in terms of things like Elves and Sneak and Show, uh, sorry, not Sneak and Show, um, Elves, Natural Order, that sort of thing. And we have this one card here, Emrakul. We're not planning to cast an Emrakul. Let me say that now. What this is for is the Painter matchup. Painter decks are quite popular and very good at the moment. So just having this one card on the sideboard gives us 
and out to being milled out. And because of an 80 card deck, we're a lot less likely to see it as well. Now saying that means we're probably going to draw it every time we play Painter today, but that's sometimes how things work. But yeah, that's pretty much the deck. Hopefully I will do some of you DNT fans proper today. I'm not really an expert on this deck, as I said. I would go as far as saying I've played this deck maybe f like four games tops I've played with this in all the years I've played Legacy, which is not a lot at all. So hopefully we can work out the lines and get there together. All right, before we do that, like, comment, subscribe. These things cost you nothing and really help me out, so do them. Okay, let's get into this league. I imagine it's probably going to be a quite long one with Yorion, Death and Taxes. All right, we're into the game now. So this is our opening hand. We're on the play. We don't have a one drop, but if we find a land in a couple of draws, we've got a lot of value that we can accrue here. I think this is fine. I don't think we're supposed to multi hit a one drop. We only have eight realistically in the whole deck. So I think we just keep this. And we start on a planes and then we can drop the Spirit of the Labyrinth on turn two. And then if we find any land, we can play Recruiter. If we find a white land, we can play an Apparition or a Flicker Wisp, depending on what is required at the time. I've got our companion popped out here to make sure I don't forget about it. Snow Covered Island and nothing else. Right, let's go for the port here. And let's play this one out. So our opponent has got Snow Covered Island in their deck, which probably means Spirit of the Labyrinth is going to do something in this matchup. Okay, so our opponent could be on the 8-cast plan here. And they just had a Snow-Covered Island. Pithing Needle. So this is probably going to name Richard Port because it's on board here. The correct play name, I think, is Wasteland here. So they might just name Wasteland because we want to Wasteland this saga. They're definitely thinking about whether they're supposed to do the onboard thing or the thing in our hand because they're taking a bit of time over this. If this is 8-cast as it looks to be, they will have a little bit of a tough time removing Spirit of the Labyrinth. Okay, so name Richard Port. All right. I'm going to attack with our spirit. We don't have anything like a Kataki to find here. So we're going to poop out our wasteland here. Just get rid of this saga straight off. No constructs for our opponent. And we don't get to use our Rishdan port, unfortunately. So we're just going to hold up our mana here. This costs three to put in our hand, so we can't do that either. An Ancient Tomb. Khan, the Great Creator. So we can attack this Khan. So it might be going upstairs. We can also Skycrave Apparition it as well if we want to. Or we can Skycrave Apparition, take the Pithy Needle turn on our port for the following turn. Okay. Interesting play from our opponent there. I think we play out our Apparition here. This can just get rid of the Khan straight up if it resolves. We don't need to do our Spirit of Labyrinth attack here because we don't really want to trade it for the Needle, I don't think, considering our opponent's probably going to have a bunch of Thought Casts, Thought Monitors, that sort of thing in their deck. We'd rather shut that off with the Spirit. Yep, Seagate Reborn. This is looking more like a sort of uh, Khan Echoes deck rather than Nate Cast. There's a bit of overlap in those decks, so we need to look out for Hole Breacher as a thing here. So I'm not really sure we want to even play out this. Hmm, it's tricky. We don't really have the mana to rush it down port and then also get some value somewhere else. It's a case of what would I most... I don't really want to let the Spirit of Labyrinth go because I've put them on some sort of Breacher deck. So let's see if this is... If they have a Hole Breacher and they want to trade for the Apparition and get 4-4, I can probably live with that. I think I'm not in the mood for the Trailblazer's Torch just yet. I think we're better off deploying a Recruit of the Guard here. So this can go and get us something like a Solitude, so we at least have some removal in hand, in case we need to... Oh, that's very tiny, isn't it? Uh, so I think we want the Solitude here in case we are looking at something like a Hole Breacher. And then if we don't have to use the Solitude, we're right. We can go get the Loran next turn after we flick a Wisp it. But I think just having the Solitude now is an emergency button in case we need it. So that we don't just get wheeled and lose all our cards. Okay, our opponents scooped that one up. So this, I'm going to put them on more Khan Echoes than um, some sort of 8 casty thing. I haven't really seen the 8 cast decks running Khan. So Council of Judgment has definitely got some text here. Rest in Peace probably has some text, as does Path to Exile here. Should be relatively easy to work out what we're supposed to cyborg because we've got so many cards in our deck, right? Mother of Ruins seems pretty medium here. Uh, Sanctum Priest is going to be good. We can put that on zero and stop things like Lion's Eye Diamond. Lion Sash. Containment Priest, I don't think that's going to be doing anything for us here. Uh, Sanctum Prelate. Bimazawa's Hours Jitte. I'm not really sure. We've probably bought out one of our... I think we can get rid of the Battle Scar. The Jitte can kill a Hole Breacher if necessary. So I think we're probably getting rid of these two... The Thalia's are going to be good if they're trying to play loads of little permanents out. The Aether Vial should be good here as well. I think we're probably 
gearing towards the Mother of Runes. So our opponent's probably not going to have much in the way of removal. I think this looks better here. All right, we'll submit like this. They could be on some sort of painter build or something, but you again, you don't normally see Khan in those decks. It doesn't mean they can't have it. Okay, so we have removal for Hole Breacher. We have Thalia to slow them down. We have Spirit of Labyrinth to mess with them. We have the Emergency Solitude in case they go super fast. This hand seems fine to me. Saprazan scary. That definitely screams Hole Breacher to me. Right, so let's just play our Mother of Runes. Uh, do we play our Mother of Runes, actually? I think we're supposed to hold up Plough just in case they have two two guys. Like, we can let it go down for something like a Thali or, or a Spirit of the Labyrinth. But this Mother of Runes is pretty weak in this matchup anyway. So I think I'd rather just guarantee the whole Breacher dies. Narset Patra fails. Sure. So this is kind of like an equivalent of a whole Breacher, except we can't path this one away. Or plow away even force of will okay so we have to force of will we gotta get through now yikes feels like we're in trouble here our opponent's kind of doing a, a broken combo -y thing and we're just not i think the, th the spirit is better than the thalia here so i'm going to use the thalia as bait this should get a force of will yeah so force of will pitching echo Vion. so i think i've correctly identified their deck and baited them into using their force of will now we have to survive another turn without them wheeling our hand away so we don't really have anything to show for it right now. But next turn we can play Spirit of the Labyrinth and hold up Swords to Plowshares. They do get to dig another four cards with Narset, which is pretty gross. Otawara. Okay. What is this? A Khan. That's all right. I'm surprised they didn't use their Narset first to get more information before they start playing their turn. But Lion's Eye Diamond. Okay. So they're just going to go for this whole wheeling our hand away thing. All right. We don't have anything that we can do here. We are down to one card. Now, the thing with these uh, Hole Breacher Echo decks is they kind of struggle to win the game. You'd think just wheeling away your opponent's hand would be good enough, but they don't really have a lot in the way of win conditions, so you can sometimes just creep back into the game. So our opponent's got a lot of mana, which means next turn they get to lock us out with Microsynth. Um, we can't stop them. Uh, we hit the Tomb here to at least force them to use their diamonds, so we get to see some more cards out of our opponent's hand before they get their Microsynth Lattice. This, this is not a play to win us the game, it's a play so we get to see four more, three or more of our opponent's cards. All right, yep, so there's, okay, they only need to crack one line that diamond, but yeah. So we've seen these cards, and then I'm happy to concede here because our permanents won't do anything. And we can't pitch Solitude to anything because it won't be white anymore. All right, that was pretty grim. Not really sure we have any other tools that help us here. We can play Ley Lines to shut off their graveyard. But Ley Lines is a pretty awful draw. But we're probably not going to get into the game in the long term if we don't shut off their graveyard. So maybe these are supposed to be in the deck first. Anyway, we've already established that Mother of Runes is pretty bad here. They do have Dismembers, but I think we can just live with, with that, to be honest. Uh, Lion Sash is fine. Rest in Peace is kind of like a Ley Line that we can cast. Uh, we can even board in the Graph Diggers. I don't think Surgical is going to be good here because they can hold priority... And then as soon as they put the Echo in the graveyard, they can then cast it. We don't get a chance to interact with it while it's in their graveyard. Now, I don't want to try and see if I can second guess my opponent that way. So how are we looking at Maybe we're just trimming some Flicker Wisps. Maybe it's something like that. I think the round of the third path is very good, though. Council's Judgment can blow up something like a Kappa Cannoneer if they're pivoting onto that as a plan. I think the Stone Forge for the Cauldra to pressure our opponent is essential. Maybe the Jitte, we've got all this other removal, maybe it's the Jitte that goes. We're just using the Stoneforge to find Cauldra as a pressure target. Let's try this. Okay, so we have a Ley Line. We don't have a lot of mana, though. We will need to draw a land on our first turn to make this hand playable. This hand is very good if we draw a land, but if we don't draw a land, we lose the game relatively quickly. Hmm. Ah, oh, you got to believe in the heart of the card sometimes, right? This is a bit of a dicey one, but we do at least have a one mana spell we can cast. So we can get rid of a hull breach or something. Not a fan of this, but just a single land completely unlocks our hand. So I think the upside is so high here. And because we're an 80 card deck, I'm not really sure how well we can mulligan into a better hand than this. We do need to get a little bit lucky with this hand, but we've got there. So I think we jam out the Spirit of Labyrinth first. Shut down any card draw. So we got, we've, we've sort of blanked Echo Vions and Days Undoing here in sort of two ways. Aligns our diamond, sure. Probably need to get around this Urza Saga soon, but we can drop a Stoneforge Mystic and use that to 
Get a cauldron, which beats everything in combat. Back over to us. We drew a ley line. Not really where we want to be. They can play a hull breacher here. That's fine. If they play a hull breacher and they trade these, we can just play another one. Sure. Are you going to trade here? Sure. If they're willing to trade the hull breacher, that's fine. We'll just drop another one. The first one resolves, so I have to imagine this one resolves as well. So this makes you think our opponent has something like a NASA in hand. They want to try and set up for future turns. The Sapriton Scary only has one activation left on it before it goes away. They can use that to make a Saga Construct, which won't be the easiest thing for us to beat. We can plow one of them away, but the other one's probably going to be quite large because most of their deck is artifacts. So Imprinted and Echo makes sense considering we have a Ley Line in play. Uh, a ways off of hard casting it. A land would be nice here. We drew a land. Okay. So they'll have three artifacts if we attack with the Spirit Labyrinth. That's fine by me. If they make a guy, we plow it, and then we play our Stone Void Mystic. So we get across for three damage, put them back down to 20. And then we can play a Stone Forge Mystic here, which means the next turn we can throw a Cauldra at our opponent, which should be pretty scary. We could go Lion Sash in case they get rid of our Ley Line, but I think that's a bit of a foolish play and we need to end the game. I'd just be an ultra cautious play that's not really going to get us anywhere. All right. They're just floating Mara on this. They could have used their Lion's Eye Diamond to make a Construct. Obviously, they'd be losing an artifact to do that, so I don't think that's a very good play. But we'll see what sort of mana base they have here. We can Skyco Apparition away their Chrome Mox if we want to as well. It seems like they are struggling a little bit on the mana front, so that's something I'm certainly in the market for doing. They have something like a whole Breach to have to cast it now, because this floating mana is going to go away. Okay. They've had enough. Uh, okay. So Cyborg cards are pretty good uh, from the Ley Line, but I think the Spirit Labyrinth is what really mattered the most there. That really just sort of jams up their angles. And I also personally... I don't think the Khan Echoes decks are that strong. Like I said earlier, they've got a lot of moving pieces, but the thing you're trying to assemble doesn't win you the game. It just draws you some cards and makes your opponent discard their hand, which, you know, is pretty decent. But if you're not really, like, most of the time they're just going to try and Khan lock you, which isn't necessarily the quickest or the least destructible thing you can do. And I don't think it's worth all the cards there. But I don't know. I've not really played these decks myself. They don't really appeal. Anyway, let's go on to round two. We're one nil up. Right, we're on the play for this one. We'll present our Yori on. Our opponent's going to get a little bit of information about what we're doing that way. This is our hand. So this is a weird one. Right, we can just play a torch later on, maybe. I think we need some sort of action. I don't think we can keep this. It's far too reactive. We need to get something on the board. Okay, this is much better. We've got Stoneforge. We don't want this torch. We can keep this and chuck this back. We've got removal. We've got a way of messing with uh, permanence here. We have a choice of whether or not we play the Caracas in case they're playing some sort of reanimator strategy. But I think we're best off just playing the planes because then we get to dodge Wasteland. We have a plow if we need it. And we're just in a safe position. That's my take on it anyway. Planes from our opponent. A currency converter. So this probably means our opponent is on Shark still. Which is probably going to be quite a difficult matchup for us, I'd imagine. Because they're going to have a lot of ways of interacting with us. They've got a bunch of removal and a bunch of count spells. All right, so this one resolved. So we'll say yes to this. And what is the correct pick of these, to be honest? They can deal with the quarter point. I think we just want the sash here because it's a thing we can cast and our opponent's graveyard is a really important use, uh, useful resource for them because they have shark typhoons they want to recur, standstills they might want to recur, uh, currency converter. You can, with this trigger on the stack, you can exile it so it never goes under the currency converter. Okay, so we have a choice here as to whether we play out our Mother of Runes or not. If we play out our Mother of Runes, we don't get to use our Lion Sash this turn. The other option here is Sanctum Prelate on one to stop our opponent's cantrips. I think the important thing here is to get the Mother of Runes down because our opponent is a removal heavy deck. If we can get this to stick, then our opponent won't have the ability to interact with us removal wise. They do have some number of Supreme Verdicts in their deck though. Sure. So this goes under the Currency Converter. If they time this right, they can do it so that we don't ever get a chance to exile their Timeless Dragon before they eternalize it. A Brainstorm, sure. Let's put in our Lion Sash. This is two to reconfigure. So we can play out a Sanctum Prelate here and try and shut off zero drops, but we don't want to just get eaten by a Supreme Verdict. So what I actually want to do here, I reckon, is attach this to the Stone Forge. And this way we can dodge... Um, a Supreme Verdict won't kill the Lion Sash then because it was an equipment rather than a creature. 
So this only pumps uh, per when permanent cards get exiled with it. But it just means that our Lion Sash means we'll have something after a Wrath here. It's not a great turn from us, I won't lie. And as time goes by, our opponent's got a lot of resources they can pull out and smash us with. But we have a lot of stay in power and we've got the extra card from the Yorion. Right, so this gives us something to pump with our Lion Sash. Ponder, sure. So our opponent is not going to be able to eternalize their dragon this turn. But if they want to make a 2-2 rogue, they can do. The reason they didn't make one when we attacked is because this goes in the graveyard. We can pump our Stoneforge Mystic so it's big enough to survive. We also have the active mother as well. Let's exile the Scalding Tarn. And I don't think there's any reason to exile anything else. We could just hold it up in case we have an, uh, a window where we can take that. So we have a planes here. I think we go to attacks with our small creature. Maybe we should have got a Cordra. Might have been a quicker way. So we could play out this Sanctum Prelate. Or we can mess with our opponent's mana with the Rishadam Port. Then we're going to try and port our opponent here. We're trying not to overextend the Supreme Verdict, but we're kind of leaving ourselves... We can't really commit too much to the board to actually have much joy anyway. Let's see what they're doing, doing end of turn here. This might just be a Currency Converter activation. We'll see. Okay, so it's just this guy. All right. So we have a plow for this. Our opponent's going to gain back a whole load of life. But we might as well strip out their graveyard here. Let's cast a plow here. They can force this, potentially. Yeah. Force Pitching Brainstorm, sure. We just clear out their graveyard as much as we can here. They're going to have Mystic Sanctuaries. Yeah, we didn't port that turn in the end. Maybe we, we should have done, but I kind of just like the idea of emptying our opponent's graveyard now. They're getting up to four islands. So they pl they counted the last one, so they probably want to count. Okay, they don't have anything. So I think we attack with this. So the card I'm scared about... Uh, there's two cards I'm scared about, really. Wandering Emperor and Supreme Verdict. So if we play this... Uh, on four, they can't do either. That's one way of countering a Supreme Verdict, I guess. Now, they might have a Terminus. It's possible. But usually these lists tend to have the Supreme Verdict. The Terminus would leave us with a Lion Sash still as well. Currency Converter. So they're not giving us a chance to do this because they're eternalizing it straight away. And it leaves the graveyard as soon as they eternalize it. So we don't actually get to interact with that one, I'm afraid. Which is a bit sad. Let's exercise Brainstorm. That does mean they could have cycled a Shark Typhoon for zero then and put it under the Currency Converter. Okay, this is a great draw. Uh, one, two, three. I haven't quite worked out what we're getting with it yet. Probably just a Flicker Wisp, isn't it? That's probably the correct play and just start, start generating loads of value. I think that's probably where we want to be here. I don't really want to attack with this. So I guess we are just going to be getting some more value with Flicker Wisp next turn. They can remove our Recruit of the Guard in response, which is annoying, but if they do that, then they're just wasting removal on a Recruit of the Guard, and we've got two for one out of it. Brainstorm, sure. The other option I was thinking about was a Spirit of the Labyrinth, so we can slow down our opponent's ability to counter it with Brainstorms and Ponders. It's a Fairy Time Reveler. Okay, so this can't bounce any of our creatures because we have the Mother, but if they have removal and the bounce, they probably fire off the removal first, and then they can get the bounce with a well, it depends if they value killing the creature or drawing the card. We'll find out which of these is more important to them. Okay, they're just plussing. All right. We can Skyclave Apparition away the Teferi. A standstill. Hmm, standstill is an interesting one. Yep, so we take the four here. Have a lot of options here. A lot of options. I think it's going to be difficult to tackle this Teferi. I think we do have to just pop their thing straight away. But are we doing it with a Teferi or with a Skyclave Apparition? I'm going to do it with the Skyclad Apparition. Okay, so we'll exile this to Ferry. So they didn't get any cards out of this. Step one. And we can go to attacks. We can attack with this guy. If they don't block, we can exile their standstill. And pump our creature. Okay, the, that window's already gone. Oh, I'm also tired opponent. <laughs> um, okay, sure. So then we can Flicker Wisp our Recruit of the Guard. Get more Flicker Wisps or whatever. Yep, we can take the four here. It's not the end of the world. Exile the standstill. I'm not going to exile the brainstorm. I'll just hold up in case they did a other thing. Okay, so I think we are looking at Flicker Wisp here. So they can cast removal spell in response, and if we go to Mother to protect it, then we don't get to get the blink because there'll be protection from white, and their removal is going to be a white spell. Let's blink our recruiter of the guard and see if we get that. Okay, I guess we're going to get attacks here. 
Stoneforge. This looks like a big shark typhoon. Let's just exile that straight away so it doesn't go under the currency converter. How big is the shark? A 6-6. Six, six. Do we want them to have the 6-6? Six, six? We can solitude it away. It's going to give them a whole bunch of life though. Hmm. We can do a tricky play here actually. If our opponent blocks, we can solitude the timeless dragon and then exile our own solitude. Yeah, okay. So that's what we're going for here. So we will cast this, get rid of this, exile this. This goes into the graveyard. And we exile this. Pumps our guy to a 6-7, which kills the shark in combat. So we've taken out both of their threats. I thought that was quite a nice play. And then we get a recruiter of the guard, so we can get some more value. What would I like here? Is it just more flicker wisps, right? It's gotta be more flicker wisps. That's what people always do against me when they're playing. Um, Death and Taxes. Just keep making Flicker Wisps, especially since they don't have any sharks right now. They can cycle one now and put it under a currency converter while I'm tapped out. This could come in for two points of damage if they wanted to. They're probably going to hold it back for a chump block though. So they could be looking at doing some more shark based activities. And uh, we just go to attack with our Stoneforge here. They can make a 4 4 shark, which we can beat in combat. So we're just going to keep on nugging away with our little guy. So. If we flick a wisp our recruiter again, we'll be getting some value. Even if they wrath, we're still going to have a card in hand, so we can add to the board. One, two, three. Let's get this guy down. We're going to blink our recruiter, and then next time we attack with our flick a wisps and our guy. So we could also flick a wisp out their rogue token, but I don't really think that's necessary. Let's just get some more cards. What have we got? Um, probably supposed to be more flick a wisps, right? Let's keep doing flick a wisps. If they use their currency converter, okay, they're going to do a shark instead. Let's exile their shark typhoon so it doesn't go under the converter. We've really managed to just take this converter's ability and throw it in the bin here. So this is just a 4-4. But we've got 13 points of damage coming in next turn. If we turn other guys sideways, we can make that greater as well. So this has to stay back on blocks. Hall of Helios Generosity, not going to be doing an awful lot to this game. We want to keep open the Caracas in case they cycle or something end of turn. We want to be able to always hit the thing. What are we looking at? Swords to plowshares. Okay, sure. We do we plow this? I mean, we just go to attacks here because they might make a bigger shark. We might need to plow away. So let's send these guys in. We can always get a flicker wisp and have plow up. This is like another shark. Okay, we'll exile the shark typhoon as per usual. Not gonna got many sharks left in their deck here. And we get a card. And. I think we're just going to let one of our flick. Well, we could lose both of our flicker wisps here, which is kind of annoying. Maybe we're supposed to plow one of them. If we just plow the biggest one. I'm going to give them a whole bunch of life, which is annoying. We lose a flicker wisp here, but they'll take a lot of that. Oh, they just took it all. Interesting. All right, one, two, and this. We'll flicker out their shark. So even if they have terminus, we have a lethal lion sash. We want to keep the mother of runes around rather than tapping it to force you damage there. We certainly have enough damage to kill our opponent this turn. Okay. A standstill, sure. Our opponent is just putting some more stuff on the stack to uh, waste our clock because we're behind on time here. Plowing our Sanctum Prelate. I think we let that go. Um, let me just go to combat here. Attack with this and these guys. Yeah, no, we're just putting more stuff on the stack to wind our clock down, which is fair enough, I suppose, at the end of the day. So, what do I want to do here? If you're having to kill sharks, I don't mind resting. I don't mind path to exile. Our opponent's going to be having a lot of mana anyway. Uh, rest in peace is pretty good against our opponent's thing. It kind of does a similar thing to Lion Sash. I don't think Umzawa's Jitte is going to be a lot of good here. Uh, Council's Judgment blows up Planeswalkers. I would like to be able to do that. A Torch might be okay here. Because they're like a control deck. They might not have enough threats to deal with this. Solitude is a threat. And removal. I think we do still have to keep our plows because, as you saw, they can generate quite a lot of big guys that we need to remove in a timely fashion. Loran can kill some stuff. I'm not sure it kills enough stuff for my liking. Something to predict good. Um, I think it might be the Trailblazer's Torch that has to go. Or a Solitude. Maybe it's a Solitude. This is still a threat. Oh, it's the Containment Priest, isn't it? All right, we got there in the end. Let's choose our companion. We need to play a bit faster than we were before. So we have to F6 our opponent's turns and we don't have any plays. Uh, we will keep this hand. We've got Ether Vial and Mother of Runes. These are both things that I'm very much looking to have in this matchup. So our opponent keep a one lander? No. Okay. 
but I'd rather try and play with Thalia now or play it next turn around a Mother of Ruins. I think I'd rather try around a Mother of Ruins. So this, yes, put the Mother in. Got a lot of things to put on a stack here. All right, so we can play this Caracas, which allows us to bounce our Thalia when we put it in. I think we put the Thalia in now so that our opponent can't cast cantrips and stuff in their main phase. Let's go to attacks. If they make a shark, we can blink it out with the Flicker Wisp. If they make something else, we can Sky of Apparition it. We've got a lot of options here. It's just like a baby shark. A dress down. How do you feel about dress down? It's pretty good. We can still Caracas the Thalia if we need to. We can put in a Flicker Wisp just as a guy. Obviously, this is going to die at end of turn, so after that's gone, we can put Flicker Wisp in. Just a 3-1, or we can put a Sky for Clay of Apparition in if they play anything. Like a Narset or a Teferi. Just down goes away. Let's sit on this. We will not put a counter on it just yet. This. Put this into our hand. Go attacks. If they want to make a shark, we can blink it. If they make a Wandering Emperor, we can blink our guy, or we can kill the Emperor. It's not a very fast clock, but it's a destructive one. And if our opponent's just got a handful of counter magic, then uh, not really going to be getting anywhere. It'd be nice if we had something good to blink with our Flicker Wisp. Something like a Recruiter of the Guard or a Stoneforge Mystic. Ah, Stoneforge Mystic. Unfortunately, our opponent can counterspell this. Because we haven't given them any other targets yet. Let's try out this Stoneforge. I suspect this is going to eat a Force of Will. Possibly. Oh no, we just got it. Nice. Okay, I would like this uh, Cold to Complete today. We can always blink this and get some more value in a minute anyway. Uh, bouncing off Thalia. Sure. Right, so Kraken Scalding Tarn. Looks like they were thinking about doing Plow there. I'm trying to play this in the main phase so we get our thing back at the right time. Let's blink out this Stoneforge. This means we get to activate it next turn. It's going to come back in a sec. They could dress down here. So we get our Stoneforge. So yes to this. Then we get the Trailblazer's Torch. Okay, they're scooping to that. Uh, I think they just didn't really have a lot going on. I'm not really sure. But we managed to somehow navigate our way through that, and we have come away 2-0 so far. Uh, I don't necessarily think I've been doing everything right so far, but it's been working. Right, we're on the play again, and we have a Yorion. That guy out, so I don't forget about him. What does our hand do? Removal, Spirit Labyrinth, Loran. These are fine cards. I think we're supposed to keep... We definitely interact with creatures, and we interact with blue decks, so... I think that's something, right? Um, we can interact with some other stuff. This is a nice combo as well. This gives us an additional draw every turn cycle because they have their draw for turn, so we tap this. Me and the opponent draw a card, but they can only, can't draw any more cards, so we get one. So we get one in each turn. A Ponder, so at least our Spirit of the Labyrinth looks like it's going to do something. Uh, I don't think we want to show them our Rishadam port just yet. Just play out the Spirit. We've got a second one, and this one isn't long for the world. That's our opponent's turn. No plays. Okay, so we might be looking at some sort of controly deck. Let's attack with our spirit. I'm kind of into having this as a draw engine, if I'm being honest. But if they suddenly like go sneak attack next turn, then I'm going to feel pretty foolish. So I think we, I think we increase our clock this turn, and then turn after we may be doing wish down port stuff. We've got a source of plowshares that we can sit on as well. Kraken Strand, true name nemesis. All right, we don't really have the tools to beat that just yet. So we're going to have to get a little creative. Containment Priest. Um, okay, so now we do need this, the round of the third path, I think, to draw cards. But I have a worry that our opponent might just have some sort of equipment to stick on this true name. But I think if we have this, we can at least draw some more cards. We are not going to blow up any enchantments. So we have two. We don't really want to blow these up. We can't really attack into this without losing a guy. It's not worth doing. So for next turn, we can start drawing two cards a turn. We might just need to get Yorion in hand soon so that we have a creature. Another true name, yikes. Okay, it's tough out there. All right, Flicker Wisp. How is that going to impact things? I don't think it does, to be honest. I think our plan here is put Yorion into hand and use this as a creature that we can race with. Um, yeah, and then we can use it around to draw an extra card and maybe we'll find something good, like... Batter Skull would be useful. Okay, so it's showing us another colour here as well. They have a Batter Skull. All right, we can flick a wisp this away, though. With that, we can flick a wisp while around on the third path. Uh, let's draw some cards. Okay, another step. They have a Batter Skull. Okay, we actually get to attack our opponent for damage this turn. Well, actually, is that true? No, because it's going to be end of turn, isn't it? So it's not going to be in play. Uh, it's not going to be... Oh, yikes. Um, 
Okay, so this turn I think we one, two, three, play this. We got a counter spell, they do have a counter spell with the brainstorm. Alright. Let's get our Stoneforge going. So yes to this. Do we want the Cauldra? The Cauldra tramples over, but the Bat Skull gives us life. Which is gonna be more important right now. Probably the life on the Batter Skull. We're in a bad shape. We're in a very bad shape. Yep. Battle Skull is on the guys. It's 7, 8, 9, 10. So they have us lethal next turn. So we might have to source to Plowshare as one of our own guys, which sounds horrible, but we'll draw an extra card here. Planes. Okay, so what do we do here? We Yori on. At the end step, this comes back, blows up Battle Skull. Then we have to plow one of our guys to survive. So we're taking six. We can't plow. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have to plow two of our guys to survive. Yikes. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. We, we, we don't even have two things. Okay, they've got this as well. I think we are done here. Right, let's go to the cyborg game. I would very much like these council's judgments, please. They seem pretty integral to beat what our opponent's doing here. I think Path to Exile to kill their Stoneforge Mystic might be useful. I don't like Trailblazer's Torch when they have these rogues that we can't deal with. Um, Jitte is fine if they've all got other creatures that we need to worry about. Loran seems quite essential here. Containment Priest probably not getting any joy for us. Um, yeah, I think that's about all we do. Beating that true name is going to be real challenging. Yikes. Right, let's show them our Yorion again. Uh, we've seen Wastelands out of our opponent as well. We can't keep this one. Uh, we can keep this one though. We could throw back a land and hope that we find one in a timely fashion. Because I kind of want all the other cards in our hand. So let's try that. Got our Mother Runes on the go. Plow on our Mother, sure. Let's try a Thalia. Bit of a nombo we're trying to cast this Jitte, but we wouldn't be able to cast an equipment next turn anyway. They didn't have a blue source up, so they couldn't daze us, which I suspect is in their deck, because that's usually in like the Stone Blady decks. Sure. So here's Stoneforge Mystic. What are you going to find? A Cauldra probably? Yeah. So we kind of need to get rid of Stoneforge's turn. A Wasteland does not get rid of Stoneforge's turn. Okay. I think we are just playing Jitte. Attacking with the Thalia. I think we're going to lose this game. Our opponent is kind of doing some of the similar things we're doing. Except their disruption elements are counter spells that cost them nothing. And they also have the trump card of Trinian Nemesis that is just better than... All of our creatures because we can't really interact with it. We have two Council of Judgments in an 80 card deck, which is a lot to ask. So they're keeping the Cauldra as a thing for blocks rather than attacks. That's interesting to me. I think we equip onto our Thalia here. We're not attacking because the Cauldra will just get us. But if they attack with the Cauldra, we can at least attack with a Thalia and it can potentially gain us some life on each swing. If they have another equipment in hand naturally, then that's extra bad for us. Right. I'm not sure what the green is for in our opponent's deck here. Could be Veil of Summer. That's what I have to imagine. So we're probably getting bashed by the big lad. No, they're just holding us back on blocks. I guess as time goes by, they get closer and closer to drawing a true name, and that just lights out for us. Um, we can play the Sanctum Prelate on one, and it stops our opponent cantripping into the true name Nemesis. Like, it shuts off our own... Okay, we're just going to cancel spell this up. We couldn't waste land to stop that from happening anyway. Let's get rid of this tropical island. Try and keep them under the Thalia for as long as we can. But we're going to need something here. A wasteland, that doesn't impact us. A ponder, sure. They did not shuffle with their ponder, so that's a bad sign for us. Still haven't started attacking. Okay, so we have a source to plow shares now. So we can plow away the germ and start attacking. Let's try that. We got a force? They do not. Okay, so this is pretty good for us. So we get some counters on Jitte. Do we kill the Stoneforge if they have another equipment in hand? I think we're supposed to. Like if they found an equipment off of that ponder that they kept, like a batter skull, that would be something they'd want to put in there. They're getting pretty close. Okay, so they have another Stoneforge. So I would have killed the Stoneforge in response to this Stoneforge entering play. The problem is batter skull is a spell they can cast soon. So we kind of want to draw like a wasteland or something. That doesn't look like a wasteland to me. So we attack with this, we get the counters, we kill the Stoneforge with them. And we've got this blank Thalia and this blank Cauldron in hand. Oh, we should have put the uh, Yorion into our hand that turn. That was a mistake. That's why I like to leave it popped out so I don't forget. All right. 
Okay, so they have the mana to hard cast a battle skull, but they're not casting it. That's almost scarier. All right, let's go to tanks. Could have something like the Wandering Emperor. That would be pretty strong here. There she blows. Sure, so we're going to lose our Thalia. Now, we do have some other Thalias, but our opponent is on a lot of life, and we don't really have any sort of grindy engines. We don't have the recurring recruiter type stuff. We're just sort of on these blanks. Okay, it's a ferry. So this can bounce our Thalia. Yep, I'm not really sure how we're getting out from underneath all of this. They got two planeswalkers controlling the board. We're probably going to take a few more draw steps and then give it up, I think. All right, so we know they've already got a banner skull in hand. Failed to find, sure. So how do we get out of this one? It's quite the jam we found ourselves in. Uh, let's play out an Ether Vial. Let's play out a Thalia. And let's pass the turn. Yep, so now they're making Samurais with the Emperor. Okay, they're brainstorming. I'm surprised they just dump the... I guess they can use the Stone Poise to dump the Batter Skull in. But they just didn't want to get two damage in there that they could have had. Another Stone Forge Mystic. This doesn't seem... Oh, they might have put back the Batter Skull with the Brainstorm, so just using it as a draw effect. Yeah, there you go. All right. So this Stone Forge is going to put in a Batter Skull, so it's not going to attack this turn. We can't attack into it. Put this on the stack. Like, I think we need to draw something like a Recruiter of the Guard this turn so we can start getting our engine rolling. A Batter Skull that we can't put in. I don't think we can win this game, to be honest. And this takes quite a lot of mental energy to play a stick, so I think I'm just going to concede this one now and try and refresh myself for the next game, the next round. Right, let's select our companion. And this is our opening hand. Not great against the old wasteland, is it? But we have... I thought it was a reasonable piece of interaction with our opponent. We, we could mulligan and get a six-card hand with trail, without Trailblazer's Torch, and it would be just as good, so I think we might as well just mulligan this. Okay, this is way better. So we have our engine here. We have a nice curve. The choice is, are we... So our opponent's mulligan to five. This makes me suspect that our opponent is either trying to play some creatures or, like, initiative creatures and have, like, the red-green initiative decks come out, or they're not playing creatures at all. But I think we can get rid of Flicker Wisp here because our recruiter can just go find it anyway. And we're not obviously getting rid of any lands here. We've got a nice curve. Our opponent's mulligan to four. So this makes me think our opponent might even be on an Echo deck. Because they can mulligan all the way down to two and get Echo and just be happy about it. Like Echo, Layla, uh, Echo LED is just great. All right, so our opponent's going first. Four cards. Okay, so it's Reanimator. Faith is looting. Okay. This means they might not have a great reanimation target. They might just have like a an Archon or something that will get them one card, but if we just hold up our plow and then plow it, then we should be okay. So I think this turn we're probably not playing out the Mother of Runes, we're just going to play out a Plains and hold up plow for whatever they reanimate here. Yeah, Archon of Cruelty. There we go. So let's play our Plains. This way we can plow and then we can play the Athalia, and if we get any sort of mana disruption, that might be enough to stop our opponent being able to develop any more in this game. Let's see. An Entomb. Ugh. Yeah, so this is a Grizzle brand, and then they're going to go and draw 14 cards, and we're going to lose the game. All right. All of those graveyard hate cards. So here comes Grizzle brand. I guess we have to go through the motions here, right? I guess they only get seven cards because it's the Grizzle brand. We do this in the end step so they can't deploy things like Lotus Petals, so they're more likely to have to discard at end of turn. Okay, our opponent's going to five, and then going to go back up to 12 here. And now they have to... Oh, they don't even have to discard here, do they? All right, the best thing we can do is cast a Thalia, and hope that our opponent can't really do anything about that. Next turn, I think we're kind of wanting to play the Mother of Runes to stop the Ark of Cruelty just coming in and eating our Thalia. It's a shame because the Recruit of the Guard... Actually, no, we can play the Recruit of the Guard, get the Containment Priest, and then the Recruit of the Guard can get eaten because we don't care about it. Yeah. All right, we're getting there. Animate Dead on Ark of Cruelty. Sure. Not great there. We, do, we can um, Solitude this. We'll get rid of one of our mothers. So we can recruit her for solitude, solitude away this. Which is pretty much what we have to do, but our opponent's got full grip. So the chance of them being able to field another creature is rather high. This is very much a matchup we have to win from the side. So we're going to lose our recruit of the guard this turn. So we can't get solitude. Yup. So we have potentially two draw steps before we're dead. But it's probably... Like, we need a good thing on our first draw step, I think. Because this is going to keep eating away our hands. We're not even going to have the food to pitch to Solitude in the very near future. 
Now we could draw a plow. It gives them a bunch of life to work with and turns their reanimates back on and stuff, but they don't actually have anything apart from a grief in the bin right now. All right, Lotus Petal. Reanimate on our Mother of Runes. Okay, so this gives us one draw to try and kill the Arkham of Cruelty. All right, we drew it. Now we should play out our land because our opponent might be able to play another Arkham of Cruelty and we'd rather have three lands and play them too. Any future things they reanimate we can't kill, so the next creature they get into play is probably game over. Mother of Runes, you have betrayed me. A Faith is Looting. This has a lot of things it can change about this game. It should mean that they can... They've got five cards in hand. So what they put in the bin, they should be able to find something this turn to... All right. This might just be a flashback Faith is Looting. If so, that's a little bit of a reprieve for us. Yeah, a flashback Faith is Looting. That's not so bad. An Arcan of Cruelty. All right. So next turn they get to do that. So we could draw con the Containment Priest in our deck. Or the Lion Sash in our deck. Those would be pretty useful. We could draw another Planes. Our opponent's got two cards in hand, but they did get to filter four cards last turn. So the chance of them having a thing here is quite high. I don't think we beat the Arkham of Cruelty once it enters play here. I'm trying to think if we have anything that might be able to interact with it. With the Mother of Runes. And they've shown that they're not going to attack for points of damage with this Mother. Yeah, okay. I think we can just call it there. Let's go to the sideboard. This is backed up by Mother... And it only takes two swings. So, I would like some Graveyard Hate, please. That seems relatively good. We have this Rest in Peace as well. Trailblazer Torch feels like a slow thing that's not really going to get us anywhere. Badass Girl, no. Cauldre, yes. Jitain, no. We don't really need Ether Vials in this because we just need all of our things to actually do something. Uh, Mother of Ruins isn't great in this matchup. The Round of the Third Path can blow up a Animate Dead or something. So I don't mind having that. I think we're probably just binning off one of the mothers here. Something like this. Like, the Skyclave Apparition can take out a Grief. It can take out Animate Deads. It can take out a Serenity if they're trying to kill our thing with a Serenity. The only other thing... Oh, we, we've got a Digger's Cage here. I didn't see up there. All right, I'd rather have that than a Mother of Runes. And we could have Path to Exile. I don't think bringing in Council of Judgment is good because it's too expensive. Path to Exile can kill something that gets into play. I think it's just going to be better than a Mother of Runes. I just don't think Mother of Runes is what we want to be in this matchup. Now, I might be wrong on that one. Someone could probably tell me about that. But I think we want to submit like this. We could even have this Mind Break Trap for if they have like a, a really good turn. But usually those really good turns involve discarding you first. So it's kind of a trap. No pun intended. Submit. Let's reveal this. Okay. This does not have Graveyard Hate. We need to mulligan. This does not have Graveyard Hate. We need to mulligan. Trying to mulligan to a piece of graveyard hate is a lot more difficult in an 80 card deck. Nope. Three cards it is. Uh, two cards it is. I guess we're, we're in for a penny, right? Okay, we finally found a ley line. So this is awful, obviously. But I just don't think that we get to really play this game if our opponent, if our opponent can just ignore what we're doing. Because the things we're doing are so marginal against what they're doing. Like, we can't really disrupt them. With the other hands we've seen. <laughs> sure. Sure deck. Now I find another one. Alright. Alright. We lose the game. What have you got for us? Can you entomb reanimate this turn? If so, I will concede the game. Dark Ritual. Playing two mana. Oh, they're just high casting a grief. Alright. I guess we carry on playing. Caracas. Okay. Not nothing. Means that we're not going to get hit by a Grizzle Brand. It just means they know to fetch the Arkham of Cruelty anyway. Another land. Okay. Mm, a lot of the cards in our deck are now playable. But our opponent's got a full group of cards almost over there. So not feeling particularly happy about this. Okay. Surprised they're not keeping some of these in hand for the purposes of... Oh, we found a Grief there. Uh, sorry, uh, an answer for the Grief. I'm surprised they're not keeping these in hand. I guess once you have four lands, that's probably about where you stop because that lets you hard cast future Griefs. We hold this in hand so our opponent might try and discard us. So we might get a two for one here. But no. Okay. We just have to plow this now. Buy ourselves some turns. This also not being in the graveyard means they don't have anything to reanimate. I think if they had the ability to put a creature in play, they would have been doing it all this time rather than just relying on the grief. So I think we've bought ourselves some number of turns. Oh my god, this is such a good draw. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe we're going to get there with this hand. Unbelievable. I don't know how much removal they're going to have. They might have Massacre in their deck. So our opponent might cast something like a show and tell now. And we cast this in response. Okay. No, they've just gone to get a 
Okay, that's a swamp. This must be getting an underground sea, I would imagine. No. Okay. I'm just hard casting a grief here. Unmask targeting us. Okay, we will cast this in response. So we got a card out of it. So that's something. We made them use the unmask. The fact they didn't get an underground sea here is really interesting to me. That makes me think our opponent might not have boarded in show and tells. Uh, I guess they have the other land, so maybe they didn't want to do it then. All right, so now we're on the beatdown. Go, go, Gadget Priest. So this does shut down all of their reanimation show and tell lines. They can hard cast Griefs, though. Hmm, a bit awkward, that one. We do have an answer for the Grief if we can find another white card. But obviously, if they Grief before we get the white card, then they can just discard it from our hand. Thoughtsies, we can't do anything about that. Goodbye, Solitude. This is something they can... Well, they can't reanimate it, actually, because... It's an argument. It's, uh, it's still caught by the claws on this. I think maybe they're just realizing that we're just getting hard cast grief again. All right. We are losing this race again. Don't really want to flick a wisp their grief. Um, but I would like a, a flyer. We will just flicker our Caracas so we can bounce something if we need to. We're not attacking into this grief here. If they attack, we have five on the backswing, and our containment priest being alive is very important. This is their second grief, so the chances of them finding another one are relatively low. I think this is pressured into attacking. No. Interesting. All right. Let's put this into play. This shuts off them being able to flash back a Faith is Looting. But now we're bashing for three. I think they just needed to keep attacking with their grief until they draw another grief in this current situation. Or draw enough mana to accelerate out something like a Grizzlebrand or an Archon. Because they can do it. They've got Dark Rituals in their deck and Lotus Petals. They're up to six mana now, all right? So Dark Ritual does it. So we can part to exile this grief. That's going to accelerate them into casting one of their guys. But it does give us a two-turn clock. Oof. How many swamps are they going to have in their deck is another question. Maybe this won't hit anything. Yeah, I think we need to just put them on two-turn clock. They got another swamp? They do not. Okay, excellent. Okay, so two-turn clock. They didn't get a swamp out of it. Perfect. Better than a plow. So this turn they have to put something into play. A Grizzlebrand we can bounce. It has to be Arcan of Cruelty. All right, we got there with our mull to one. Uh, yeah, cool. All right, do you want to change anything here? I don't think so. I think that was more or less how we drew it up. So we just run it back. We have some graveyard hate here, but is it good enough? Like we're probably gonna get discarded turn one. Let's see if our, our opponent's mulligan to six. I think we have to keep this and just dump her Grafdigger's Cage into play. And then try and port them out, maybe. Until we port them out for a turn. Then Recruiter for Containment Priest. Our opponent is now mulligan to five cards. So, we'll see. We have a turn one piece of Graveyard Hate. And we have a turn four piece of Graveyard Hate. With a Richdown port to bridge the gap. Bit iffy, to be honest. Let's see how bad their turn one is for us. Okay, we're losing our Graftaker's Cage. I see. So, there might, this might just be a Grief Reanimate grief type hand so not like a super terrifying one but it's going to pick us apart a little bit and force us to beat them down over uh, force us to try and draw back into the game whilst they beat us down now they might just have some other stuff going on here but we'll see okay didn't have a reanimate or they didn't fire it off let's play planes and see how we do so a 60 card death and taxes build would be a lot better here okay they got in tomb if the last card in their hand is reanimate and we are absolute taste but the um the 60 card death and tax is better because it's more streamlined so you're going to find those cyborg cards a bit more. Whereas we have more toolboxy targets. But if a game is short and you don't have a lot of time to draw the specific answers you need, you're going to get a little bit buried, I think. I've heard a lot of people saying that 60 card DNT is better because it's better against Delver because it's more concentrated about what it's doing. And being good against Delver is somewhere where I think you want to be at the moment still. I think Dragon's Race Channel is going to be the best deck in the format for as long as it's around just because of the selection power that card gives you. Okay, are we getting Grizzle branded? Let's see. Exhume. All right, we're getting Grizzle branded. And they get to draw 14 cards here. I think we're done here. I don't think we can beat that. All right, we are two and two going into the final round now. Um, our opponent was doing unfair stuff and we're doing fair stuff. That's gonna quite often end badly for us, I would imagine. All right, let's see how, if we can get the three two. All right, we're on the draw. Let's show them our companion. One drop, removal. We have a lot of removal. Um, I guess we're supposed to keep this one. 
So making some tokens, we're going to be in a good place, right? Because we can flick with them out, and then we can Yuri on back. Once upon a time. Okay, so removal looks like it's going to be good here. Let's see what they find. This could be elves. It could be the red green initiative deck, which is popping off at the moment. Caves of Chaos Adventure. Yeah. Okay. So it's a red green initiative deck. That I might have mentioned earlier as well. Okay. Let's play out a one mana one one, which might be attacking soon, just so we can get the initiative. Clone Mox. Sure. What are they going to print? And once upon a time, Cavern of Souls is going to name human, I imagine. I think all of the ones they play in the, in this build are human. Fury, pitching this Chaos of Chaos Adventure. Okay, not happy about it. Not furious about it, but not happy about it. We lose our Mother of Runes. And what have they got to follow up? Is this another Chaos of Chaos Adventure? Sure. So we probably lose this game now. DNT basically fell off the map while the initiative was around. So I'm suspecting we're losing this game. Because apparently the initiative is still a thing that you're allowed to do. Which is... Very unreasonable. So, we're going to make a Lion Sash because this is a creature that can attack our opponent. We have Solitude to try and get rid of this Case of Chaos Adventurer so we don't get attacked by it. I think we do this now. So we'll evoke pitching this Flicker Wisp, I think. We do it now so they only gain 5 life instead of 7. How dead are we going to be this turn? We do have another removal spell. Wow, they scooped it up. Huh. Well, that was weird. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Okay, I need some removal spells. So let's put removal spells in our deck. These are removal spells. Trailblazer Torch is good here because it allows us to steal the initiative. The Rand can blow up some of their bits and pieces. Spur of Labyrinth, pretty medium here. Containment Priest has text. Ether Vial is like mana ramp to an extent, so it can be useful in this matchup. Like we can sort of attack their mana base and then sit behind the Vial quite nicely. Uh, Batter Skull, we might need that to get back into the game. We don't really want to blink there, guys. Sanctum Prelate, I think, is not going to be useful here, right? We can put on zero, but the time's already passed then. We can put it on one, but that's going to hurt our own removal. So I don't think we want that. Uh, Flick Wisp does have evasion, so I quite like Flick Wisp for that reason. Spirit of the Labyrinth doesn't have the most text here. They're not really a deck that draws a lot of cards. So I think that's probably the cut here. Mother of Runes helps you slide in, steal the initiative, stuff like that. So I think this is what we're going with. All right. That was a very early concession from our opponent, in my opinion. We have two removal spells. We don't have a creature to take the initiative back, though. So... Hmm. We do have a deck full of creatures, though. So I think we do keep this. We can grind out some value later on. We have some removal. Someone who's better at DNT will probably tell me that I've made a mistake. But you haven't got someone better at DNT. You've got me. So we're keeping this hand. Let's see what our opponent goes for. Cavern of Souls, sure. Wasteland of All, which is nice. Chromox, imprinting. Fable and Mirror Breaker, sure. Mother of Runes. So we found a one drop. I think we want to cast the Mother of Runes now, just so that we have something that can take back the initiative. We just need a creature in play at all times. And then next turn we can play Eat of Isle and potentially Path if we have to, and get the initiative. And then turn after we can cancel his judgment. And just keep getting the initiative back off them and hope that that does something. It's going to be tough. So there's the cavern that we've seen, so we can dismiss that. Giant. Uh, that's the green one is a giant. Okay, so we're getting an evoked fury here. So same play as last time. They're pitching a Caves of Chaos Adventurer to kill our Mother of Runes. Do they have a fourth mana? A Trinisphere. Kind of wish we had the Aether Vial, but sure. All right. So in our opponent's upkeep, we will Richard and Port their green source. Since they're clearly trying to play to the giant guy, I guess. So now we're in a bit of a funky situation. We can just keep porting them, or we can try and play out something of our own. Tough call. We can blow up their Chrome Mox. That's also an interesting one. Hmm. We can play out the Aether Vial now, but then that's such a slow one. I think we're just going to play out the Recruiter here. And this will get us... What is this actually going to get us? Probably uh, a Skyglow Apparition here. Because if we have to pay three to, for a removal spell anyway, we may as well get one with a body attached. It's either that or the ran, right? To blow up the Chrome Mox. They didn't have a land last turn. Okay, fail the Mirror Breaker. Kind of wish we got the Loran, but sure. Okay, a Wasteland. Hmm, tough. Tough decisions here. And we play out the Wasteland. We play out this. We get rid of their Fable. We crack away their Cavern. 
we're trying to strand our opponent underneath the their own twin sphere here because our deck does mana now pretty well i take it sure they can attack with a shaman token and then they can get the initiative we can kill whatever creature they play if we need to and then get the initiative back and then probably chump block with a guy okay they're not doing anything here interesting the caracas tap two okay in this turn we put this in our hand no no no, no, no. We, we need another land before we can do that actually um so we're either rich down porting them or we're playing something out i guess we're playing out the thing that stops them from being able to cast more spells and also can block this shaman okay so it's gonna be hard to keep them off of mana now okay so this time we have a planes so we can put yorion into our hand and then we tap down our opponent's tiger next turn i guess we get pretty blown out by a fury here okay a chaos adventure awkward but not the worst i should have another rich damn port which i'm certainly interested in for the future our removal spells always cost three mana council of judgment is more flexible okay so we get attacks we attack with these two so it just guarantees the initiative i think we were supposed to start ticking up our ethervar now if we played this on turn one instead of mother of runes we would have won this game by now i think we're still right to do that so we can trade here and stop them getting the initiative which i think is worth doing now if they have a creature that has the initiative then you know that's annoying for us but we gotta play the game that we're dealt sometimes right i meant to stack these the other way so i could see the cards i'm scrying with but this is i guess we could forge our guy actually if we forge our thalia they can't attack into it okay flicker wisp how do we want to f approach this flicker wisp game so play this out we can flicker wisp away their chrome mox or we can flicker wisp away their token and flicker wisping away their token is where i want to be here flicker this away and we go to combat they can have an endurance here but we kill it in combat then we go to our opponent's upkeep here i think we tap down hmm let's tap this one down and let's tap down the tiger so this way they get one spell this turn if they want if they want to cast a spell and they might have to use treasure for it which makes further porting better okay is this the under mountain guy i don't think our opponent has any more basics so this ghost quarter will be a uh, strip mine minsk and boot it's a pretty good one they will get the initiative here they could they, they shouldn't sacrifice this to kill the flicker wisp but it's a thing they could do i think they put counters on this attack get the initiative then we kill this attack them flicker wisp away get rid of the boo and we're sitting pretty then i think we're in a reasonable spot oh they are going for the sacrifice line interesting sure so that lets them draw one card it's going to trap isn't it um i guess we are trapping our opponent Stoneforge Mystic is a pretty interesting one here, isn't it? Um, like, I think we have them dead in one turn anyway. So I think we're supposed to just kill this Minsk and Boo and stop them getting any value off of it. Oh, no, that was a that was a huge mistake, actually, wasn't it? We had to win there, right? If we play the Stoneforge Mystic, we can just go and get the Lion Sash. Uh, hold on, one, two. Then we go one, two, three for Lion Sash. One, two to equip. Two, two. Yeah, we had to win there. I'm not used to playing Death and Taxes. It's not really a great excuse, but it's the one I'm using. So, Right, so we have this Ghost Quarter. I don't think our opponent's got any more. Uh, let's activate this. Put this into play. Um, we got the mana to cast the Calder, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So we can Ghost Quarter their Ancient Tomb and tap down two other lands. Or we can play the Yorion. I think we just play the Yorion here. One, two, three, four, five... All right, so we got the 3-2, which is, which is I'm happy with because I've not really played much DNT apart from borrowing people's decks in the pub and having a little jam with it. So positive record, I'll certainly take that. Let's have a little chat about the deck. So this deck, it has a lot of toolboxy elements to it, but I think for me personally, I prefer the way that regular 60 card DNT plays where you're guaranteed to get the certain bits that you want and then your sideboarding becomes a little bit more precise as well but you do lose the flexibility of having some of these little corner tools in your deck because there's only so much space you have so you can't be like you can't have sash containment priest prelate and all these things together but you also do get more reliable access to the mana denial portion of your deck and i love mana denial 
But uh, the Trailblazer's Torch that we had today, that's kind of like the exciting thing in the list. Didn't really do very much for us today. So not, not sure I can comment on that one. It's quite an expensive one. And a lot of the time it's not going to be better than getting a Cauldre or a Batterskull. That's my take on it. But there are definitely situations where you can have it. So in a Yorion list where you've got all this extra padding in your deck, I can see having it. But if I was playing a 60 card DNT, I, I don't think I'd want it. But that's just my take from someone who's pretty much just playing on this for the first time. Cyborg wise, uh, I think the cyborg, the problem with this deck, in my view, is Yorion. Yorion is an incredible powerhouse and does a lot of things. It's a free card that blinks all your stuff and gets you more cards. And it's just an absolute late game engine house. But it does mean that your cyborg becomes, you know, you have to dedicate eight slots to graveyard hate and you don't really get much else. Well, it's nine slots even. You don't really get much else to go with it. That's kind of because we've got these silver bullets in the main deck, but trying to find your silver bullets with a recruiter of the guard against the decks where you need them is just way too slow. Whereas if you had like, you know, three, two drops that you really needed for whatever reason, you could just draw them and have a bit more play that way. But this deck's got loads of redundancy, right? So you've got Solitudes and Plows and Skycrow Apparitions. You've got the Recruiters that can find you multiples of these if you need them. And you can just flick a Wisp Chain if you need threats. So, you know, it's a powerful deck that does some cool stuff. It's not a broken deck. It is a fair deck, which means it's going to struggle against some of the things that can do, like the turn one and turn two stuff that just puts you in the ground. But that is the price you pay for these sorts of decks. But the upside you get is as the games go longer, you can eke out more advantage and grind a little bit better. And you do get to start the game with an additional card that is very good. Is this a deck for me personally? I don't think so. This isn't how I like to play. I like to have I win buttons in decks. I play a lot of combo, as you've probably seen on my channel. I like to have an out where I can go, okay, we're in a dire situation, but this can win me the game. Whereas this sort of deck, you have to play quite precisely to sort of grind up your percentage points. But if you play really well and know what you're doing, you can really get there and actually get your way back into games that you are losing quite handily. It's happened to against me quite a few times and I've certainly watched other people's streams doing that sort of thing too. Nevertheless, uh, that's not how I like to play Magic, but I think it's a good thing that people like to play this sort of deck. I think it's a really healthy thing to have in the metagame. It's, nothing, it's not doing anything too unreasonable and there's certainly some ways of beating it if you really want to. It's never going to like dominate, but it's always going to be you know, pretty potent in the hands of some of the masters out there. And there are some real D&T masters going who, uh, who who definitely put up results that are way better than you'd expect for a deck that is kind of drawing one card a turn, playing white guys sort of thing. But I hope the, the, the many of my subscribers who've been asking to see me play D&T, especially the Yorion build, I hope you're happy. Uh, we got 3-2, so I'm pretty chuffed with that one considering I'm a bit ropey with approaching this deck. So... I uh, hope I've done you proud and I didn't make too many embarrassing mistakes, but if I did, let me know. I want to learn. Obviously, there's a term where I could have put a urine into my hand and I didn't. I caught that one, but there's probably loads that I missed and some other decisions that were different. So teach me because at the end of the day, I don't know very much about this. I'm just someone who plays a lot of Legacy, but not this deck. So please, uh, I love hearing your feedback. So while we're talking about comments, why not also like my video and why not subscribe to my channel? And if you really like, post my videos into your discords, group chats, Reddit threads, whatever. It all helps me. And I'm so close to getting a thousand subscribers, which can get me some money back. So please help me out. All right. I think we're done for today. I hope you all enjoyed this one. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.